This presentation is not meant to tell you what to do. It is merely to inform you of the facts so you can make an informed decision. First point. Viruses are unique. Antibiotics don't work on them because antibiotics target mechanisms like reproduction or membrane formation in living things. And unlike us, or bacteria, viruses are not truly living things. Yes, they move and cause diseases, but they lack one of the key things that qualify a thing as alive. Namely, they do not reproduce. At least not without a living host. Much like the alien xenomorph, take away the host and they will either die or go into hibernation. But, if they're not alive, what are they and where did they come from? Essentially, viruses are a unique formation of a couple of proteins and other molecules. During the early days of planet Earth, unique circumstances of environmental and chemical factors collided to create organic molecules called amino acids. Essentially, amino acids are an alphabet which, when combined in certain ways, can create anything from a simple protein to a complex strand of DNA. But even more impressive is that certain of these molecules seem to have natural attraction for one another, coming together to form entire structures such as cell walls, cells, and eventually entire organisms. On our one planet in so many millions, we just happen to have the right materials with the right conditions to create this self-forming alphabet of amino acids. If something that complex, yet inevitable, isn't the work of God himself, I don't know what is. Viruses came from the leftovers of these building blocks of life. They stopped forming before they were truly alive. And as they found that they could survive without life, they just kept on going. They survived without reproduction, simply hijacking the reproduction of living beings to create more of themselves. An ongoing microscopic war began as living cells and organisms developed immunities to these viruses. Antibodies, a unique fork-shaped structure, was developed to latch onto viral walls, acting similar to a throwing star, grappling hook, and homing beacon all in one. I will come back to antibodies later, but know that they are what helped the white blood cells target and destroy the viruses. Viruses are tough. As they are so simple, they're difficult to destroy. Think of it like this. It's easier to destroy a huge building made out of Legos than it is to break a single Lego. Thus, things that can take out bacteria, such as soap and alcohol, work only marginally well on viruses. They may scrape them from your hands, but the little guys are still, well, not alive, but kicking. Most of the chemicals that can truly destroy a virus are either harmful to living tissues or incredibly expensive and used mainly by hospitals. Now, viruses are very long-lived. They don't have the same metabolism that other living cells do. Much like zombies, they crave living flesh, but do not need it to survive. It's only imperative for their spread. Thus, they can continue to exist on surfaces or be carried on the winds for several days before they are no longer a threat. Viruses spread in a way that is straight out of a horror movie. They latch onto a host cell and inject their own unique DNA code into that cell. The DNA then hijacks the cell's nucleus, forcing it to make not cell components, but fully functioning viruses. As soon as the cell has exhausted all of its materials, the swarm of several viruses bursts forth from the husk of the now dead cell and floats off to repeat the process on an ever-expanding scale. Now, to the virus in question, the coronavirus. This virus gets its name not from the beer or the thing you see around the sun during a solar eclipse, but because of how it behaves. Much like other viruses, it latches onto a host cell and injects its unique DNA code into the cell. However, it's also developed a nearly foolproof method to hide from the body's immune system. It rips off little pieces of the cells it attaches to and wears them as a false face. It's like the Hannibal Lecter of the viral community. This blocks their surface from any antibodies that may identify them, making them look like a normal cell to white blood cells, thus allowing them to pass through the body and continue their insidious infectious work. Viral incubation times. Many viruses and bacteria have a strategy they've developed over billions of years. They use a technique known as quorum sensing to communicate with one another. It's not vocal communication, but chemical. With these chemical messages, they can get a unique view of how many of their own kind are present in the body. The more long-lived viruses are essentially like Skynet, 
waiting for the proper time when there are enough of them to spread so widely and densely that when they finally choose to attack, or in the case of viruses, are activated by enough high concentration of chemical signal, their victory will be thorough and complete. Viral Victory A virus's ultimate victory is to hijack not just a cell to reproduce for it, but to hijack an entire organism. This organism will then cough, sneeze, and whatever, them into the air, where they can spread to other organisms and have a chance at their own victory. They feel nothing, not pain, nor fear, nor remorse. If given the chance, they will kill you. They are the simplest machines in the world, ancient and far more deadly than any we have come up with. Who is vulnerable to these? The old, the young, and the immunocompromised. These people can and have been killed by this virus. As of writing this, my home county of Los Angeles has already suffered from over 1,200 deaths, and it's continuing to rise. Even if you and your family are strong enough to fight off the virus, it can still use you as a vehicle to reach the vulnerable and kill them. Now, who is to blame? I have my opinion, but I'm not going to be sharing that. This talk is for facts, not opinions. And while most of my evidence points to one major culprit, my sources are not free from alternative motivations. Overall, this virus has caused so much damage that even if we were able to officially assign blame, the damage is so bad that no amount of reparations could even begin to fix it. The only silver lining is that the entire world is affected, so though blame cannot be assigned, whoever caused this is likely suffering as well. Final point. How do we get back? First off, antibodies. Antibody therapy is a short-term solution. It involves taking the antibodies from someone who has faced the virus and injecting them into another person. Essentially, it's giving an army, your immune system, specialized ammunition without giving them the instructions on how to make the ammunition. As soon as they run out, they can't make any more. And if the virus hasn't been completely taken out, it will come back. Immunity. A person, if strong enough, could develop immunity from being exposed to the virus. However, during this time, they would be highly infectious, even if they didn't show symptoms, and could spread the virus to anyone around them. Some of the people around might be babies or old people, and could die from these virus. Thus, the person is risking more than their own life. They're risking the lives of innocents around them. Vaccination. Vaccines are the best option for long-lasting immunity. Basically put, vaccination involves taking a bunch of the virus and weakening it to the point where they can't put up a fight when injected into an organism. The problem is that the virus can't be so weak that they're instantly destroyed by the first line of defense, the white blood cells called neutrophils. The virus needs to survive for long enough for the lymphocytes, the more specialized white blood cells, to be called. These lymphocytes, upon scanning pieces of the virus's skin, for lack of a better term, develop specialized antibodies and keep a memory of how to produce those antibodies in specialized memory cells. Thus, when the real virus shows up, the immune system has their unlimited supply of silver bullets to deal swiftly with the invaders. Getting the virus to this specifically weak enough point is very difficult and takes at least six months of careful testing to make sure that it won't kill you or just be completely ineffective. The arguments against vaccines are quite flawed. The largest argument, that of autism, was the result of a scientist who faked the results of his test for his own ends, and has since admitted as much. The dangerous chemicals that everyone talks about are called adjuvants. Put simply, it's something to make the neutrophils have trouble taking out the virus so the lymphocytes can be called in. But because the virus is so weak, it can't spread on its own. It tricks our immune system into thinking that it is a bigger threat than it actually is. And thus, the big guns are called to eventually scan and make their own antibodies. Now, herd immunity. This is a term you may have heard before. Even when we get enough vaccine for everyone, if not everyone takes it, the virus can come back. We've eradicated several viruses in the past, such as polio and smallpox, through mandatory vaccinations. However, if not everyone gets the vaccine, the virus can not only survive within them, but learn as well. Even if a healthy person's immune system fights off the virus, if even a single viral molecule survives, it can learn how to change its appearance so the antibodies can no longer stick to its surface, and they become invisible to the immune system once again. Once it has undergone this change, 
No amount of antibodies or vaccines against its previous form will do any good, and the pandemic will begin once more. In conclusion, my overall suggestion to everyone, stay inside, or if you have to go outside, do so in specialized protective equipment to reduce the risk of viral transfer either to or from yourself. Wash your hands, practice regular hygiene, and when the time comes, get the vaccine.